I want to begin. We're going to begin a verse by verse study tonight in the uh, book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going to go through 1 Thessalonians, five chapters, and then we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians, three chapters, only a total of eight chapters. Uh, 1 Thessalonians has five chapters, I just mentioned. It has 89 verses, 89 verses, and approximately 1,857 words, 1,857 words. We, uh, the Apostle Paul, of course, is the author, and uh, we don't know for sure, but it's probably the first epistle that Paul writes of the Gentile epistles, because he probably wrote Hebrews before 1 Thessalonians. Uh, the book is very basic, therefore it's a, it's a good book for new converts to read. Uh, I personally think it's better than, I mean, all the Bible's good, but I think it's personally, uh, I think it's better than John as far as for a new convert. And John's good, but a lot of people recommend John because some of John is to Israel doctrinally. And some of John gets kind of deep. I mean, you get into the resurrections and different things in there. Uh, there's a lot of different things doctrinally. 1 Thessalonians is a Gentile epistle to a Gentile church after the crucifixion. All right, many basic doctrines are covered in uh, Thessalonians. Paul visits this place in Acts chapter 17. Thessalonica there is mentioned in Acts 17, verse 1 to 4. And probably writes 1 Thessalonians in Acts 17, verse 1. Because Acts 17, 1 says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollyon, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. So, uh, he uh, probably writes 1 Thessalonians there in Acts chapter 17 sometime. Alright, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, I want to say this. One of the reasons why I like to go verse by verse in, in books, we've taught, I don't know how many books, Genesis, and we're teaching Genesis, and we're taught John, we're taught Revelation, Daniel, Ruth, uh, 1 Corinthians, Acts, uh, because every word of God is pure. Yeah. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. There's something about these words on these pages right here that is different than another book that you might have. This, this word of God is quick and powerful. Amen. Quick, it's alive. Quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen piercing even to the dividing asunder soul and spirit of the joints and marrow as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4.12. There's something about going through. I mean, I know you go through Chronicles, you go through those genealogies that you say, man, what in the world did God put this in there for? I, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Yeah. So how can Chronicles be profitable? I don't know, but just read it and trust it by faith. Amen. When this one begot that one, and that one begot this one, and this one begot that one, you can't pronounce half the names, just say, praise God, this is the word of God. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that's why we like to go verse by verse in these books, because uh, uh, it requires a lot of studying, but uh, that's what we need to do as, as preachers, go through the word of God, because there's something about going through the Bible and reading these verses. Now, Silvanus is mentioned here uh, in verse 1. You take Van out of his name, B-A-N, it's Silas, uh, C-S-I-L-U-S, but it's, the, it's probably the Silas of Acts 17.4, Acts 17.4, and Acts 16, Paul and Silas got thrown in jail, remember that, and they, God got him out, and the foundations of the prison were shaken and all that. This is probably the Silas of Acts 16 and 17 there, obviously, and also in Acts 15.40. Notice that Paul always has companions with him. He mentions here in 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, uh, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. He's always mentioning different people that travel with him. 
He's always mentioning different people that are around him, people that refreshed him. He goes through different people that refreshed him. There at the end of Romans, we went over that verse by verse study, Romans 16. So there's something about uh, him uh, wanting to he always having people around him. What that does is when you have people around you, it helps to keep you accountable. Yeah. Accountable. And, uh, you know, God said, you know what God said about Adam? He said, it's not good for the man to be alone. Every man knows what I'm talking about and knows what the Bible's talking about when it says it's not good for a man to be alone. Brother Sammy Allen, who just passed away here a year or two ago, down in uh, Georgia down there, uh, he preached for many years, uh, about 45 meetings a year. And I heard him say it several times. I've heard other preachers say that he said it. He always took a younger preacher with him because he stayed in motel rooms. Do I need to explain? And he wanted to be held accountable. He didn't want somebody starting something on him. I saw Sammy Allen with a woman in a motel room. Or this and that. He, that, that, that. he didn't want that started. He always traveled with a younger preacher. All these meetings for years he went out. They had three meetings at his church. They had three camp meetings. June and August and November. Then there's three revivals, three, or three meetings at his church. That's six. And then he took Christmas week off. That's seven out of 52 weeks. So 45 meetings a year, he was gone preaching all over the country for 40 years probably. But he always traveled with a younger preacher. And he said he did that to be accountable for what he watched. He didn't, I don't think he even turned the TV on but uh, in the motel room, but if he did turn the TV on to be accountable for what he watched on TV in the motel room and especially be accountable for uh, watching, you know, around the motel and so forth. So he, uh, Paul always had people with him. Paul always had people with him. So he mentioned it here, Paul and Sylvanus and Timotheus. It helps to keep you accountable. And uh, so you say, I don't always want people around me. Well, probably be good. When God said it's not good for the man to be alone, God knew man because he made man. All right? It's not good to be alone all the time. You might get in trouble. Verse 1, notice it says, uh, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it says, uh, verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians, which under the church. Now, refer, the church refers to local churches like Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, Colossians. and also refers to to the church, which every born-again Christian is a part of. All right, you're, If you're saved, you're part of the body of Christ. You're part of the church. Now look back at a couple of books in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22 and 23, and notice that uh, the body is the church. If when you're saved, or by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. When you got born again, Christ baptized you spiritually into his body. It's not talking about water baptism. It's talking about spirit baptism. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, 22. Ephesians 1, 22. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, to the church, 23, which is his body. The church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. All right, so the church, it really is made, this is a local church. Galatia, of Ephesus, Smyrna, Thessalonica, all these churches that Paul wrote to, they're all local churches. They're all local churches. But then every born-again Christian is a member of the body of Christ, is a member of uh, the church. All right? And when Christ raptures the church, uh, every born-again Christian that makes up the church, the worldwide church uh, of born-again believers, is going to go up in the rapture. By the way, the rapture is talked about in this book here in chapter 4, which we'll get into later. But uh, so the, the church there, 
There are unsaved people in local churches. But there are no unsaved people in the church. Amen. You have to be born again to be a member of Christ's body. Yeah. The church. All right. But there are unsaved people in local churches all over the country. Mm -hmm. And what happens? You say, how, well, how do you know that? Well, some people, you know, they, they got, you know, they got baptized and they think they're saved. Or they're good, trying to be a good person, so they think they're saved. And uh, so that, you know, that isn't true. That isn't the right thing. There's, there's religions and so-called churches all over Highland County where people are a member of, but they're not saved. Or I can name all the different religions and false cults, but I'm not, I'm not going to do it, you know. But, I mean, that just because they're a member of a local church. What's the squealing? Is there a squealing going on? Beeping. Huh? I've been doing it all day. Something's beeping. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but anyways, uh, anyways uh, so the, uh, what was I saying? Uh, they're members of local churches. Yeah, if you're saved, you're a member of the body of Christ. If you're saved, you're in the church. But a lot of people in local churches, so-called local churches around America and around the world, they're not saved, but they're a member of that church. All right, you got. I mean, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but Catholic religion. I mean, you got billion, over a billion Catholics, a billion Muslims. They're a member of their churches, but of course, most of them are not saved. You know. Most, if not all, I don't know. You know, so uh, so when you make when you make now you got what you have around uh, all over is you got briars, all right. You got Baptist briars who think that you have to be a member of a Baptist church, all right, or you're not going to go to heaven. You're not part, or you're not part of the bride of Christ. Well, John Wesley was a Methodist. What's that make him? He had a part. If John Wesley had a part of the body of Christ. Ain't, ain't none. If you part of my English, ain't none of us. John Wesley, he lived it. He believed you had to live it or you lost it. All right, him and his brother Charles Wesley. They started Methodism. They started the Methodist Church in the 1700s. Martin Luther started the, in the 1500s the Lutheran Church. Come out of the Catholic Church. Got saved. And uh, Pope, the Pope hated him back then in the 1500s. And, uh, so, and then in the 1700s, John and Charles Wesley, they started Methodism, the Methodist Church. So the Methodist Church is about 250 years old, 300 years old, whatever. And uh, so those those uh, churches. So what you have is you've got several different religions or cults that believe that you have to be a member of their church, or you're not saved. Roman Catholic Church. You're not. You're, if you're not a member of the Holy, I'm not saying this to be mean. I'm just telling you the truth. We're teaching the Bible. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church teaches if you're not in their church and you haven't been to catechism and all that stuff partaking of the Mass and the Eucharist, all these different things, the wafer and all that, then you're not saved. All right, the Mormon Church also teaches that, that you have to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The uh, Church of Christ also teaches that, that if you're not a member of the Church of Christ, because that's Christ's Church, is that right, Brother? That's right. That, exactly. You were in that, right? Yeah, you're exactly right. They taught that. They teach that. All right, so you have to be a member of their church. All right? So the Church of Christ, the Mormon Church, the Catholic Church, and uh, probably the Jehovah's Witnesses. If you know if you're not a Jehovah's Witness, you're probably not going to heaven. You know you're not going to be one of the 144,000. <coughs> I have never stood up and preached in 43 years of preaching. I have never stood up and said any, in any pulpit anywhere, at any time, any place, anywhere, that if you're not a Baptist or a member of this Baptist Church, you're not going to heaven. I've never said that. So who is the narrow-minded individuals? Steve Kogel or these other people? Not me. I, I preach what the Bible says. If you're born again, you're going to heaven. Amen. I don't care if you're a member of a church down in a sewer hole. All right, It don't matter. If you're born again of the Spirit of God, you're going to heaven. Amen. See? So, uh, so the, the local church... The local church, every Christian ought to be a member of a local Bible believing, Bible preaching, teaching church. It's very, very important. But to make the local church the church, the only church that you got unsaved people in local churches, quote unquote. But there are no unsaved people in the church because you got to be born again to be in the church. And a lot of religions and churches around America and around the world, you don't have to be born again. You just be a good person, get baptized, get sprinkled, and do the best, very, the very best you possibly can, and everything will be great, and wonderful, and you'll make it to heaven, according to them. All right. Uh, notice in verse one, still in verse one, 
Uh, last part of the verse. Grace be unto you. Grace. With grace, you can go anywhere, do anything that God tells you, and go through anything Amen. that you have to go through. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which is with me. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, three times the word grace is in 1 Corinthians 15.10. Let me quote it again. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But Paul said, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So in other words, by the grace of God, you are what you are, and God will take you and mold you and refine you into the individual that he wants you to be. Yeah. All right? Now, a lot of times we'll tell young Christians, don't try to be somebody else. Well, yeah, you know, be yourself, but there's nothing wrong with trying to be somebody else and to take after a young preacher taking after an older preacher, but... Don't try to do, be have their personality and there because you have your own personality as a young Christian, a young preacher, whatever it might be. There's nothing wrong with imitating somebody that's uh, you know been down the road far longer than you have or that type of thing. But God will take your temperament, your personality, and He will mold that into the vessel that He wants, and it takes years for Him to do it. Years. And a lot of people aren't willing to wait. I'm not saying it'll take 80 years, but I'm just saying, you know, it'll take years. People want it six months or a year or two. And it, it doesn't happen. God, God through through a, through a number of experiences, trials, tribulations, valleys, disappointments, discouraging things, blessings, high times, low times, through a combination of all. Huh? I still hear it, the beeping. Through a combination of all these different things, God will take these things and he will use them for his honor and his glory. All right? And uh, so uh, look back a couple books here in 2 Corinthians 12. Look what Paul, look what the Lord told, uh, look what Paul uh, was told by God uh, in 2 Corinthians 12 about his thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 12 Verse 7. Remember the thorn of the flesh that uh, Paul got? 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn of the flesh. You know what God was afraid of? He was afraid that God, Paul would get lifted up in his own self because of all the revelation knowledge that God gave Paul. All the things that God revealed to Paul, God was concerned about him getting puffed up within his own self and thinking, boy, I'm somebody. Look at all this stuff God showed me. And the man wrote 14 of the 27 New Testament books. Think of that. Think of if God chose you to write 14 of the 27 New Testament books. That's half over half, a little over 50%, 14 of 27. Half of 27 is 13 and a half. So it's right at 50, 55% of the New Testament is written by the Apostle Paul, one man. John wrote five books. John's pretty close to Jesus. John and Jesus were big buddies. All right? But John wrote five. Peter wrote what? First and second Peter. Two. Peter's one of the main characters in the Gospels. I mean, he messed up a lot. Every time he opened up his mouth, he messed up, it seems like. But he loved the Lord. He really did love the Lord. He wrote two, first and second Peter. But Paul wrote 14, if you include Hebrews, which I believe he did, 14 of the New Testament books. So lest I should be exalted above measure, there was given to me a thorn of the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. He prayed three times, it looks like, that it might depart from me. Paul didn't want it. He said, get it out of here. I don't want this thorn of the flesh. Verse 9, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. There's that grace, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. See, God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. That's what he just said. For God said to Paul, my strength, God's strength, is made perfect in weakness. In your, he's talking about your weakness, Paul. When you're weak, then I can really work through you. I don't mean God wants all of us, you know, half dead all the time so he can work through us. But it means that Paul, God was going to especially use this guy here. He's going to especially use him. 
All right, uh, verse 9, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Well, that's hard to do. In reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. When I'm weak within myself, then am I strong. God can use me. That's what he's saying there. All right, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Moving right along here, 1 Thessalonians 1, uh, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all. Now, Paul's a southerner, obviously, for you all. Hey, y'all. He's, he's from the tribe of Benjamin. That's a southern tribe. For y'all. Hey, y'all. I lived out south for eight years. When I went out, when I, when I went out uh, knocking on doors down here in North Georgia, and uh, we do about soul winning. And, of course, everybody down there is saved. Because you know, there's a Baptist church. And there are not only a Baptist church, there's all kinds of churches. At Chattanooga area, North Georgia, Walker County, down Fort Oglethorpe, down through there. There's a Baptist church on every street corner. So we go out knocking on doors and they say, come on in! I walk in, I start talking. I, didn't, I wasn't talking 20 seconds. Bill don't want me teaching this book. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, I would I would be talking twenty seconds, and they'd say, "You ain't from around here, are you?" I'd say, "No, I'm from Ohio. I knew you was a Yankee." <laughs> so I knew you was a Yankee, and uh, some of those people are still fighting the Civil War down there. <laughs> and uh, anyways, uh, I mean, we you know they weren't mean or nothing. You know, they just said, "Hey, yeah, uh, what church is this?" I saw us, you know, told the name of the church. So we go down here to the church here, you know. And, uh, I mean, there's churches everywhere. And there's churches down there. I mean, a lot of them have 100, 150, 200 people. And there's churches that have 500 and 1,000 people down in that area. Several of them. And uh, uh, re revivals, camp meetings, vacation Bible school, all that type of thing, that's old hat down there. They've been doing that for over 100 years down south. Nothing down there. Every church down there has a vacation Bible school. They got out there on the sign during the summer. And uh, they have revivals and they have everything. Uh, everything. All right, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Now, uh, there are several people in the Bible that prayed. And if I wanted to get something from God in prayer, I believe I would read the prayers of great men who got things from God. Great men and women who got things from God. All right, now there's several men in the Bible. Uh, there's Daniel prayed. Uh, let's look at this real quick. I'm not going to read the whole thing here. But look back at Daniel and uh, Daniel chapter 9. And you ought to study the prayers of people in the Bible and see how they prayed and see how they got things from God. Because the time's going to come when you're going to want God to answer your prayers. Uh, Daniel 9, verse 3. Daniel 9, 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek my prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord of my God and made my confession. And said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and to them that keep his commandments. Look, watch here, verse 5. We have sinned. He includes himself. Daniel includes himself. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled. We've rebelled, God. I've rebelled. We've all rebelled. Even by departing from my precepts and from my judgments. Notice that part of praying is confessing your sins. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets. We haven't listened to your preachers, prophets which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. Verse 8. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face. You have confusion of face when you've got sin and rebellion in your heart. They're confessing, he's confessing the sins of himself and the people. And he says confusion of face. You know what brings confusion in a person's heart and soul? Sin. 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 Brings confusion to the heart and soul 
of an individual. God's not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. And uh, so here in Daniel 9, 8, O Lord, to us belong with confusion of face to our kings. So the kings got confusion. To our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. See that? Verse 10, neither we obey the voice of the Lord our God. I mean, he says it over and over. We sin, we haven't obeyed yet. All down through there. He goes on down through there from Daniel 9, verse 3 to 19. I'm not going to read all that. He gets the answer in verses 20 to 27. By the end of the chapter, Daniel gets his answer. We're not going to read all that and go through all that. All right. Uh, Ezra, uh, Ezra prayed, and uh, he, uh, look at Ezra 9, and, uh, and he prayed, uh, Ezra, well, I'll just give, I'll just read, to, I'll just give to you the verse. Ezra prayed in chapter 9, verse 3. Uh, Daniel prayed that in chapter 9, verse 3 to 19. Uh, I don't want to read all that. Uh, a lot of the psalms are prayers. And a lot, of the, a lot of the different psalms in the book of Psalms are, they're called uh, imprecatory prayers. It's, it's David praying judgment down upon people, different people. Oh God, send judgment, you know, basically wipe them out, you know, do this and that. Now, the New Testament, we can pray that, but it's a little different than the New Testament. I mean, David was going up against all these different people, the people of Israel, and fighting against different people and the enemies of Israel. The Old Testament's a little bit different on that. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray judgment down upon a wicked ruler or king, but because I have, to be honest with you. You say who? I'm not going to tell you. But uh, it, David said, go get them, God. You know, judge them. Imprecatory prayers. And... Uh, but in the New Testament, really, we're supposed to pray for kings. Brother Frank brought that out in last, I believe last week there in his Sunday school lesson. Uh, as much as we don't like, you know, who's who's running our country right now, we are commanded to pray for him, Amen. as he mentioned there. All right, it's hard. It's hard, you know. And uh, but we're we're commanded to pray for. We're praying for kings and for those in authority that we may lead a quiet, and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. First Timothy two one and two. All right. And then uh, look at 1 Chronicles 29. I'll show you another prayer that David prayed when they took up this great big offering to build the house of the Lord here. Uh, 1 Second Kings, 1 Second Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Look at this uh, prayer that David prays about this offering that they got. Now, uh, Brother Estep and his... Uh, notes, commentaries that I was going through in uh, 1 Thessalonians, he brings out that David gave, I forget how many millions of dollars back, back then, thousands of years ago. David himself gave millions of dollars toward this offering. I forget how many millions that Brother Eastup said it was. He figured it up somehow. 90. 90 million? 90 million dollars. 90 million. Look at 1 Chronicles 29.10. 1 Chronicles 29.10. Wherefore David blessed the Lord, blessed the Lord, uh, let me get this. All right, First Chronicles twenty nine ten. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory. He brags on God and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above, above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand is, it is to make great. See, it's God's hand that makes you great. In thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. You know who makes a man or a woman great? God. Amen. Thirteen. A lot of people think it's their, themselves. <clears throat> when you begin to think it's yourself, you cease to be great. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody was talking about one time about what makes a certain preacher great. They said, well, I think it's because he stayed with soul winning for 60 years, or I think he pastored that church for so many years, and he's such a great pastor, and this and that. He gave all these reasons. One guy stood up and said, I think what makes Dr. So-and-so such a great preacher is that he doesn't know it. Amen. He honestly doesn't know it. They were talking about Dr. Lee Robertson down in Chattanooga. 
You know, Brother Homer Smith had him in twice down there, and I, I went up to him, and he signed my Bible. And the man makes you think that you're better than he is. I'm serious. He makes you, when you get around, you he make, it's not a false humility either. He, he, you, he makes you feel like that you are superior to him. And, I mean, all those guys, they all, they all died in their 90s. Uh, Dr. Lee Robertson, Dr. Falwell, Dr. T uh, Tom Malone, all those guys died in the 90s. And they were all great men. Verse 13, now therefore our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Look at look what David says in verse 14. But who am I? David says, who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? <coughs> See? We're talking about here in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 2 where Paul makes mention of it in, in, in these people in his prayers. We're going over Daniel <coughs> praying and Ezra praying and and David prayed here in, in 1 Chronicles 29, 14. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? They gave a great big offering. For all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. In other words, it was yours to begin with, God. What David says. For we are strangers before thee and sojourners, as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow. There is none abiding. O Lord our God, all the store that we have prepared to build thee a house for thine holy name cometh of thine hand and is all thine own. They're getting ready to build a big house, you know, a big temple here. And they took up this big offering. And it's, 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 it's a great big offering. And he goes, I'm going to read all this. Verse 17, verse 18, 19. Uh, Verse 20, and David said to all the congregation, Now bless the Lord your God, and all the congregation bless the Lord God of their fathers, and bowed down their heads, and worshiped the Lord and the king. And they sacrificed sacrifice unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings unto the Lord on the morrow after that day. Even a thousand bullets, a thousand rams, and a thousand lambs, uh, rams and a thousand lambs, with their drink offerings and sacrifices and abundance for all Israel. Uh, Uh, 25, and the Lord magnified Solomon exceedingly. Uh, I was looking for the verse. I thought there was a verse there where David told him to quit giving because they had so much. I thought it was in that chapter. Maybe it was in uh, uh, the previous chapter. I can't remember now. But anyways, uh, they gave and gave and gave, and uh, they, David, David is humbled by the giving of the people. And he's humbled by it. He says, Lord, who are we that we're able to give after this sort? And he's basically saying, what we gave was yours anyways. You know, everything you have is God's. Amen. All right, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, also, uh, we won't turn to it, but Nehemiah prayed. Nehemiah, remember when he heard about Jerusalem, the walls being uh, burned down and the gates burned with fire? In Nehemiah chapter 1, Verses 3 to 11, he prayed. The whole, prays the whole chapter almost. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah prays. All right? And he, he, he cries. He weeps because he, he hears about the people of Jerusalem, how the walls and the gates are burned down, and he wants to go and build the city. I taught Nehemiah verse by verse 2. Or the first six chapters. I know the whole book, didn't I? I teach the whole book. I think I taught the whole book. But anyways, uh, yeah. But, uh, so uh, we went through Nehemiah and how they build how they build that wall, and uh, the people had a mind to work. And uh, that's in Nehemiah one verse three to eleven. All right. Uh, an interesting thing about Paul is that he rarely prays for himself in his epistles. Now he did pray about the thorn in the flesh in Second Corinthians twelve. I'll give you that. <coughs> he prayed that God might take it from him. It might depart from him. But other than that, uh, I don't know, I, mean, I can't think of another place. If you know a place, let me know. If he did, it wasn't very much. I, he doesn't pray a lot. He prays for others. He says to this church that he wrote to, making mention of you in my prayers. All, constantly, always, you know, always. And, uh, and so forth. So, as far as what's recorded in his epistles, we don't really find Paul praying a whole lot for himself. 
I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for yourself and pray for your needs and things like that. I'm not saying that. But <clears throat> he requests that other people pray for him. Constantly he said that, pray for us. that we, you know. Uh, the only exception to this would be in 2 Corinthians 12 where he prayed for God to take away the thorn of the flesh. All right? Going on to 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, number one, and labor of love, number two, and patience of hope, number three, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. All right, now, several things. Work of faith. The work is produced by their faith. A person can say that they have put their faith in Jesus Christ all day long, but until there's some works involved, until there's some fruit there, you and I are probably going to wonder because all we, we can't see their heart. All we can see is what fruit is produced by their so-called faith in Jesus Christ. Now, James talks about this exact thing. Look at James chapter 2, if you would. James chapter 2. And uh, look here at James uh, chapter 2, verse 14. James 2.14. James talks about this exact thing right here. The work is produced by their faith, the work of faith. James 2.14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be dead and naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. <laughs> Think about that. Hey, brother, God bless you. See you later, man. Be ye warmed and filled. But I don't give them nothing. I don't help them. But be ye warmed and filled. God has a sense of humor. Uh, be ye warmed and filled. And notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. See? So that's James 2, 14 to 18. Let's go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians 1. So he talks there, the, the work is produced by their faith. Then the labor of love is mentioned secondly. The labor of love is the labor that love produces. The labor, the work that love produces. For the love of Christ constraineth us, Paul said, for 2 Corinthians 5, 14. The love of Christ constrained Paul to labor for the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Sometimes it might seem like it. Sometimes you might seem like you're beating your head against the wall. But just keep right on going by faith. Yeah. Keep coming to church. Keep reading your Bible. Keep praying. Keep witnessing. Passing out tracts. Inviting people to church. Inviting them to the tent revival. Keep going. You say they won't listen to me. It doesn't matter. Do it anyways. Yeah. <laughs> uh, labor of love is the labor that love produces. And then patience of hope is the patience that is produced by hope. Now, you cannot have patience without hope. James said, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Uh, knowing this is the trying of your faith, work of patience. But let patience have her perfect work. It's, a, it's used in the feminine sense. Let patience have her perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In other words, let that patience, let God work in you. That patience. And that produces hope. That's James 1, verse 2 to 4. Paul talked about it in Romans 5, 3 to 5. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation work of patience. And patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. That's Romans 5, 3 to 5, and James 1, 2 to 4. Same type of verses. That it produces experience. There's trials. My brother count, uh, my brother count it all joy when you fall. Count it all joy. When you fall into divers temptations, knowing this is the trying of your faith. Faith being tried, worketh patience. It works patience in you. The flesh hates it. The flesh don't like it at all. Amen. But let patience. You realize 
I remember when I was growing up as a little kid, and my aunts and uncles, I'd get around my aunts, you know, two or three times a year, it was a special occasion, and my aunts would say, oh, Stevie has grown so much. Of course, they were talking about how tall I was getting, never about how big my stomach was. But, <laughs> uh, Stevie has really grown. Look how, look, oh, Mary, my mom. Mary, he's, Stevie's really grown. They haven't seen me in a while. If people hadn't seen you in a while and in a Christian life and they know and, and you've gone through some trials, they can see spiritual growth in you. Yeah. They can see maturity in you. They can see that you've grown up a little bit since the last time they saw you. Amen. Six months, a year, two years, three years, whatever. You know, I don't know. But, you know, it's been a long time, whatever it is, since somebody saw you. So my aunts talked about physical growth. But if you haven't seen somebody in a while, maybe a friend or something you, you haven't seen in five, ten years, and you hear about the trials that they went through, and you knew they were kind of immature, kind of silly, and kind of stupid acting, you know, you know, five or ten, fifteen years ago, but you see them now... You said, man, they've grown up. Yeah, you know why? Because knowing this is the trying of your faith work of patience. But let patience have her perfect work. That, that perfect work, God's working a perfect work in you. Yeah. It's God doing it. The hand of God. And, uh, and what happens is, is that after a while, people see you and they say, wow, man, they've grown up. I think of one particular missionary right now, I'm not going to say their name because I know this is going out. But uh, before he went to the mission field, he, him and his wife, they have a bunch of children and so forth. Uh, before they went to a certain mission field, he was kind of cocky, arrogant, immature, you know, and everything else. He got over a certain field and he had little babies die in his arms on the field. He saw a lot of death. I'm not going to tell you the country because then they'll give it away, uh, possibly. But uh, it's a third world country. And, uh, you know, it isn't Canada you know, or the United States or something. It isn't even Mexico. But uh, he had a lot of trials. We heard that he had a lot of trouble. My wife and I heard a lot. He had a lot of trials and a lot of problems and different things. But the next time I saw him several years down the road, all that cockiness and arrogance and self-centeredness and self-exaltation and gone, baby. Amen. It was gone. He was a real man now, a real missionary. But see, God let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, entire being, entire. Not, not perfect in the sense of you know, I don't sin no more. Perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's James 1, verse 2 to 4. There's something about it. Uh, all right. Uh, the more you trust God, the more you know He's going to work things out, the more patience you'll have with the problems and situations of life. The work of faith deals with salvation. The labor of love deals with their service after they're saved. And the patience of hope deals with sanctification. Three S's. The work of faith deals with salvation. Labor of love deals with their service after they're saved. And patience of hope deals with sanctification. In other words, when you're mature in the Lord and you've experienced some things and that perfect work has been, done, been, do, been doing some things in your life and God's done some things in your life, you don't have to have everything right now. Give me everything right now. <laughs> you don't act like a baby. You don't act like a child. You don't have to have all the little trinkets that a lot of the people in the world are having. I'm not saying anything wrong. I'm not saying nothing wrong with having nice things or anything. I'm saying you don't have to have everything now, and you can do without some things. You can actually do without some things. You know, a lot of Americans they can't do without anything. Yeah. The newest little toy or gadget that comes out, they got to go out right out and buy it in five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to have everything that everybody else has, <coughs> everything else they've got or wants, when they, when they want it, because you have a hope. Your reward is coming later on. Yeah. Everything's going to melt with fervent heat anyways. Yeah. Paul explains these three things uh, in verse 3. 
uh, the, the work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. He explains this down in verse 9 and 10. Verse 3 matches down there in verse 9 and 10 in the chapter. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. All right? What manner of entering in we had unto you, that is verse 3, your work of faith. That matches the work of faith. And then verse 9, it's common, and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. We'll comment on all this later on. How ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's the middle of verse 3. That's the labor of love. Turn from God to idols. Uh, turn from idols to God. All right? And then verse 10 matches to wait for his son. Verse 10 matches the patience of hope in verse 3. The patience of hope. You're, you're waiting on Jesus Christ to wait for his son. We're not waiting for the seven years tribulation. We're not waiting for, we're not waiting for Jacob's, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation. We're going to be out of here before that. And that's what he's talking about here down here. All right? Because the end of verse 10 says, which, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And that wrath is primarily not only talking about hell, but it's talking about the tribulation. All right? You turn to God from idols. That's the work of faith. To serve the living and true God. That's the labor of love. And to wait for his son. That's patience of hope. And that matches Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope. What are we looking for? We're not looking for the seven years tribulation. We're not looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus to come back and get us out of here. Amen. Amen. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13. All right. Uh, let's see. Going on here. Uh, verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 1.4. Knowing, brethren, beloved. Oh, here we go. Your election of God. That's a three-hour message here, but I'm not going to go through everything. He's not talking to an individual. He's talking to a group of people, a church. It's a corporate election. All right? Election in the Bible, and I've gone through this many times, so I'm not going to go through all the verses, but election in the Bible always is corporate unless it refers to one man. Now, there's three elect bodies in the Bible. Three elect bodies. In other words, it says specifically that somebody is elect. First of all, of course, Israel is elect, according to Isaiah 45, 4. Isaiah 45, verse 4, Israel is called the elect. The church, every born again Christian is made up in the church. The church is elect, according to Ephesians 1, 4. Ephesians 1, 4. And then Jesus Christ is elect. He's called the elect precious. He's called precious, too, in 1 Peter 2, 6. Elect, comma, precious. And you don't you believe he is a, you know, precious, he's elect. Uh, that's 1 Peter 2, 6. Election is always based on foreknowledge. All right, the verses on election are Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his dear son. What God did was, John Calvin taught, and I went over this in great detail in Romans. All right. John Calvin taught that way back in eternity, God said, I'm going to elect this group over here to be saved, no matter what they do. You're elected. You're going to heaven. And this group over here, you're damned. It don't matter what you do. No matter if you're not going to repent and receive Christ because uh, it's not God's will for you to be saved. Or you're not one of the elect. That is not according to the Bible. Amen. What God said is, way back in time, he said, whoever gets in my son, whoever believes the truth, and gets saved and repents of their sins and is born again, they get in Jesus Christ, all right, they'll be one of my elect. I will elect them to go to heaven. All right? You weren't elected before eternity. You weren't even born yet. You were not, you're not even in existence yet. You didn't even exist. All right? What God said was, God, election is based on foreknowledge. God says, whoever repents of their sins and receives my son, I and going to elect them to go to heaven to be saved. And that's what Romans 8.29 talks about. That's what 1 Peter 1.2 talks about. Now, since we're right here in Thessalonians, turn over to 2 Thessalonians 2.13. I'll show you this. We went over this verse also. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Don't be, don't be scared about election. It's, it's not a scary thing. Uh, John Calvin and the Calvinists, they teach this hyper-Calvinism stuff. 
And I'm going to tell you something. It produces a fatalistic Christianity because what happens is you just say, What's, what will be, will be. So why go out knocking on doors, slow winning? Why witness? Why pass out tracts? Why have a tent revival? <coughs> Whoever's going to be saved is going to be saved. Let's just sit here and twiddle our beads for 30 years and do nothing for God. It produces a fatalistic Christianity and it puts everything on God about salvation. Well, you have a will to get saved. Mm -hmm. See? And what they're doing is they're taking away a person's will. When you take away a person's will to be saved, you've messed up the plan of salvation. They're some of the biggest heretics in the world. Yeah. I mean, really, I can put up with an Arminian losing your salvation than I can. I don't, I don't agree with that, but, but I can put up with that easier, I guess. Easier than a hyper Calvinist because a hyper Calvinist basically is perverting the gospel yeah, right. and damning souls because they, you know, I've talked with especially older men and I said, Sir, they're like 70s, 80s, 90s. I said, yeah, You ever been saved? Well, the way I look at it, preacher, when God gets ready to save me, He'll save me. And they act like they said something really sophisticated. And they just said something and acted like a complete dunce. Yeah. They've been under a hyper Calvinist preacher or teaching or church. Yeah. No, listen, big boy, when you get ready to get saved, it's your will. It isn't God, it's yeah. you. Do you want to burn in hell? Do you want to repent, receive Christ your Savior? Don't throw it on Him. He's already done what He's going to do. He, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Yeah. Jesus yeah. would be beyond recognition, man. Yeah. Don't throw it on God. It's your move, big boy. Yeah. Yeah. It's me irritated. Second Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. This is a long verse. Brother and beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to be saved before you were even born. That's how they read it. Chosen you to salvation through what? Sanctification of the Spirit. When did you get the Spirit? Finish the verse. And believe for the truth. When you believe the truth. When you believe the truth, you, were, you got the sanctification of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit come inside you, that's when you were chosen. And not one second until. Amen. See that verse? Chosen you to salvation, don't stop reading, through sanctification of the Spirit. How'd you get the Spirit? If you may have not the Spirit of Christ, he's not of his, Romans 8 verse 9. And, and belief of the truth. You didn't believe the truth before you existed. Come on. And they say that you were in Christ before the foundation of the world. If you were in Christ before the foundation of the world, when Adam showed up and sinned and you fell out because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, as an Adam all die, even so in Christ you all be made alive. So what happens was, according to Calvinists, you were in Christ before the foundation of the world, which you really weren't, but according to them you were. Okay, we'll just go by what they say for a second. I'll just lie to you for a second. They say that before the foundation of the world, you were in Christ, but then Adam, when Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis 3, you fell out of Christ, and then when you got saved, whatever day you got saved, whatever year, you got back in Christ. What if you fell back out? <coughs> you see how harebrained that teaching is? You got churches all over. There's a bunch of them in Cincinnati, a bunch of them down in Kentucky, West Virginia. There's a bunch of them all over this country. And, uh, all right, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5. We'll stop here. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance. When Paul preached, he had assurance he's preaching the right message. As you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Notice what manner of men we were. Paul's preaching was not only in word only, not only in, but in power and in the Holy Ghost, he says here, and in much assurance, because, but because he lived the life. It, it was in word and power and Holy Ghost and much assurance because he lived the life. Without people living right, the gospel loses its power. Now, there's power in the gospel. Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, also to the Greek, uh, Romans 1.16. So the gospel's got power. But the, believe it or not, the gospel can be diminished by a Christian that is a worldly, carnal, immature, 
out in the world, living for God and the devil half the time, this and that, and he tries to he or she tries to witness somebody, it doesn't have that punch to it that it would have if the Apostle Paul or somebody that had lived a halfway Christian life would tell somebody about it. See? So your manners, your manners has a lot to do with how effective the gospel is going to be in your life in relation to others. Your testimony, then, is very, very important. Because yeah. he says, you know how, verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you the word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and much assurance. Now listen, he finishes the verse. As you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. He said, you know what manner of men we were. You know what manner, we had manners. Literally, manners. Manner, we were a gentleman. We preached the word of God. We lived the Christian life. That he lived the life, and then therefore Paul had that much assurance and power in the Holy Ghost. Amen. There's something about that. Amen. Amen.